And this will require a little bit of experience. So we'll start with a simple one, and then we'll come back here and, and do this one. Let's do a first order equation. First order equation. U prime minus 7u equals 0. And we're going to guess once again. And in order to make the, who, who can guess the solution in this form? Yes. Who, uh, more, much more interesting, can everybody guess the solution in this form? So I don't think so. So I'll rewrite it in a form where if you just say what you're looking at, the solution will present itself to you. You just have to say, you know, it's a, it's a tremendous skill that a lot of you don't have given your background, given how they teach math in high school and, and even in college. Uh, the skill of looking at, a, at an equation and saying it in words. And sometimes the same equation commands totally different words and it makes it a totally different equation. So I will write it in this form. U prime equals 7u. And the way you would describe it in words is, I'm looking for a function whose derivative is 7 times the function. And of course it's e to 7t. And nothing else. Or is it? Okay, well, <laughs> with one small caveat that will discuss in just a moment. So u equals e to 7t. And this caveat, I really want to frame in linear algebra terms. Because you could say that any multiple of this also satisfies the equation. Right? If I took 5 times e to 7t, when you take its derivative, 5 just comes out, and once again you get a multiple of what you originally had. So you can argue on, on the basis of calculus that it's any multiple, excuse me, any multiple of e to 7t. But I don't want to argue it on the basis of calculus. I want to argue it on the basis of linear algebra, which absorbs the calculus in it. Because when I look right here, I see a linear operator. Now in this class we haven't talked about linear operator linear operators on their own. So at some point, once we have a little bit of experience with all of these equations, I'll come back and we'll spend some time clarifying, well, what exactly is a linear operator and what would not be a linear operator? What would be a nonlinear operator? But for now, let me continue with just saying that it's a linear operator. And we have found an element, before we even had this C, of its null space. But we know how the null space works. It's a space. If it contains a vector, it contains all multiples of that vector. Am I right? So this times c, you should see not in calculus terms, but in linear algebra terms. We're looking at the null space of a linear operator. So it's null space. The most important part of it is that it's a space. And space is a word whose importance dawns on you over months of studying it. Right? But it's this, but it essentially is the fact that if two functions are in a space, their sum and multiplication by a scalar is also in that space. It's that closure under linear combinations. Here, we don't have two uh, linearly independent functions, so there's nothing to add. But we still have closure under multiplication by scalars. So that's the most important way of seeing it. I think that in many other ordinary differential equation courses, you would approach this equation and you would use integration, I'm sorry, separation of variables, a very special way of solving equations. And then you'll find that this constant appears initially in a different funny place, and then finally finds its way out here. You would, you would find it here, e to the 7t plus c. That arbitrary constant of integration will first go here, and then you say, oh, it's, it's, we have a sum in the exponent. We can break it up into a sum of two things. I'm only speaking to those who remember separation of variables. I've been trying to forget it for 20 years, and I can't get separation of variables out of my mind. It's just such an ugly thing. 
It's such an ugly thing because it's so particular. You spend so much time on it, uh, a disproportionate amount of time of it on it, and that leads you to believe that it's important. And it's completely unimportant. It's much more important to know what it means to solve a differential equation and what the solution might look like than knowing a particular way of solving it. But typically, people will use separation of variables to solve this, and then the constant will be more of a calculus constant. But I like to think of it as a linear algebra constant. And calculus is only in the background supporting the linear algebra framework. OK, so I think we've captured it all. <laughs> so now we can take a guess here as well or for what the null space might look like. So let me erase some of the things on the board now and concentrate on the null space. But what I will do here is guess an exponent, hoping that this is not that much different than this. But I will not know what the exponent is. I'll just denote it by an unknown letter, by an, as an unknown, lambda. And then we'll see, maybe we can determine that special value of lambda. OK, we're now pursuing the null space. So we have to solve the homogenized equation. My guess will be e to lambda t. Not 5t, not 7t, I don't know what it will be. e to lambda t. u sub guess equals e to lambda t. When you hear the letter lambda, what concept do you usually think of? Eigenvalues. So you actually won't quite see eigenvalues here, but it is an eigenvalue in a certain well, not certain, very, very specific sense. Hopefully, we'll have to review that too because it's, because it's awesome. OK, so I will now plug it in, and I will clearly get lambda squared e to lambda t. Do you agree with me that this is the second derivative? Minus 6 lambda e to lambda t plus 8 e to lambda t equals 0. And now, what's usually said, and I think it's fair to say this, is that e to lambda t is always positive, never 0. So we can cancel it on both sides. So I would have canceled it even if it was 0 sometimes. We can talk about that separately, but you know, being zero at one point, I don't think would change that, change a whole lot. You would have to think about it, but I would, that's the first thing I would do anyway. So it gets canceled. And we're left with an algebraic equation for lambda. There's no t left. It's just an algebraic equation for lambda. And it is lambda squared. So what this tells us, again, take a step back and Try to tell yourself, what did we just discover? Well, we just discovered that perhaps this will work, but not for any lambda, only for very, very specific values of lambda. For those values of lambda that satisfy this quadratic equation. And those are 2 and 4. Yes, you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to use the quadratic formula. The first line of attack against the quadratic equation is to say to yourself, I'm looking for two numbers whose sum is 6 and the product is 8. You transport yourself back into third grade and you ask yourself, can I think of two numbers whose sum is 6 and the product is 8? Can you? I think you can. 2 and 4. Now, if that doesn't answer the question, then you can use the quadratic formula. But a special quadratic formula with an even second co linear coefficient. You guys know that special form of quadratic formula? Well, I'll add it to lemma someday. OK. So lambda equals 2 and 4. And you can kind of sense the presence of a greater power. Because we knew we had to have two of something. 
Remember I mentioned that the null space of a second order linear operator is always two-dimensional. We also know from our treasure hunt logic that we need two conditions to get rolling, two initial conditions to get rolling. So everything comes in just the right numbers, two. Isn't that nice? So second order, two additional conditions that we will need. And this uh, gives us two possible solutions to this equation, to this null space equation. So the two solutions are, and again, what I want to say is two linearly independent solutions. I'll go to the bottom of the board. R, E to the 2T and E to the 4T. These are two solutions. But I do not want to single them out in any way over the infinitely many solutions that this system has. Because could I take E to the 2T plus E to the 4T? Of course I could. What I have just done is just simply found, again, I'm just calculus, how should I put it? You know, calculus here offers the battlefield, but the fighting is all linear algebra. So it just happens in the country of calculus. But calculus really is an afterthought. What my mind is on most of the time is the linear algebra structure of what's going on. So I have just found two linearly independent elements in the null space. So if I want to capture the entire null space, I will just put one coefficient in front of this, just like we used to do in linear algebra, alpha and beta. Alpha this plus beta that. Except here the tradition is to call them C1 and C2. Doesn't matter. C1, C2, and very definitely plus because that's what the null space is. It's all possible linear combinations of its spanning set. So that's our null space. And so we can now write down the general solution to the system, E to the 2T plus C2 E to the 4T. And this is very satisfying, I think, because everything worked out as a student of linear algebra would expect, which we all are, right? They're just the right numbers, you know? This is where I would get, if something wasn't working out in calculus, while I have a linear algebra picture in my head, that's when I would get nervous or excited, you know, because that's the guiding light. The manipulation is, is detail. Okay. Okay, so we have discovered the general solution. So, yes, everything worked out, but I will once again repeat that this, the very forms of these functions, the, what the, exactly they are, is a detail compared to this and compared to the fact that we knew that the null space would look like C1 times some function plus C2 times another function, as we mentioned last time. So all we did now was fill in the, bl the blanks, what those functions are. Obviously we need to do it, but it's not quite as important. So this is the general solution. So of course we need to bring this problem home, which means pick initial conditions and determine C1 and C2, just so that you can see a problem from beginning to end. But first, we'll come back to it in just a second. Let's apply the same logic here and see if it would have worked. And of course it would. So let's just march through the logic. It's very helpful to apply the logic you just learned to a simpler situation. So whenever you just learn something and you want to get a better feel for it, don't go up in complexity. Go down in complexity. It's, it especially works in computer science and actually, I always find that when you solve something numerically and you took your time step, remember we talked about it last time? And you got a very approximate solution. Your instinct is to make it smaller so that the solution is better. Well, my first instinct I've taught myself is to make it larger. 
just to see that the solution becomes rougher, because that's what ha should happen as well. So I always go down, not up. It seems to work better. So let's go down here. So I will, this step right here can be skipped, because simply by looking at this equation, you can figure out what the equation for lambda will be. Because whatever the order of the derivative, that's the power of lambda. So when I plug in e to lambda t into this equation, I just get lambda minus 7 equals 0. Lambda equals 7. So our null space is any constant times e to 7t, just like it was here. Okay, so the same logic works. And if you wanted to go up in complexity and imagine a third order equation, well then you'll just end up with a third order polynomial. And then you'll ask Mathematica to solve it, right? Does anybody know the formula for solving third order polynomial equations? How about fourth order? Yeah, I'm beginning to hear some very good suggestions. Yours was, your, yours was 18th century, yours was 21st century, which is good. I love both centuries. What about fifth order? Does not exist. Did you guys know that? That a formula for fifth order polynomials does not exist and cannot theoretically exist for a general fifth order polynomial called Galois theory. Okay, so we're, I'm going to erase this, we're done with this. And we'll actually solve, we'll actually pick a pair of initial conditions and finish the problem.